Monday, November 8th, no more baseball, uh, nothing going on. We had a good World Series, though, and across from me, I guess symbolically across from me, on my screen is the guy who called Braves in six. It's Jeff Conine, and how are you feeling? You, you're going to buy some lottery tickets? You feeling good about no, Braves in six? I should have put my money where my mouth is and and gone to Vegas and put a nice chunk down because I, I probably would have gotten a nice return on that investment. Yeah, that was a good pick. I had seven and I was hoping for seven, but game six, I got to go out there. It was an unbelievable opportunity. Got to go to the game with my mom. It was great memories, but man, that was a one-sided, one-sided ball game. No doubt about it. Dejected would be the word I would use to describe all of those Houston fans. But I mean, what did you see in that? I mean, Max Fried was special. I would love to get your thoughts from, you know, how Max Fried looked uh, from the television, because from my angle, it's hard to appreciate the pitches when you're off to the side a little bit, but I mean, he was locked in. How much of that do you think was Max Fried just dealing versus a Houston lineup that just a lot of bad at bats. I felt like they squandered a lot of hitters counts. They expanded the zone. It didn't seem like they were uh, that same Astros team that, you saw throughout the postseason and the regular season. Well, we talked about this Houston uh, offense and how prolific they were and even historic as far as what they did, what they accomplished in the regular season. And I think we didn't see that in the postseason. So when we talked about getting into the postseason, it's not always about the best team. It's who's the hottest team. And I think collectively we did not see the year long Houston offense perform the way they did in the postseason. And that, we saw, in the, especially in the Brave series, uh, in Atlanta, there was a lot of opportunity squandered. They had a lot of guys on base. They did not come through with big hits. Uh, Alex Bregman was pretty much ineffective the entire World Series. Yep. Um, you know, Brantley didn't do that great. It was just, uh, they, had, they got nothing going. But you have to give some credit to the Atlanta pitching staff. I mean, Freed there at the end, uh, you know, I was watching with Griff that last game, and, and he was struggling that first inning. And I thought, you know yeah. what, I think the Astros are going to blow the doors off this one. And I thought... If they got to a game seven, I'm that would be a shift in momentum, and I would I would probably go back and say the Astros have the upper hand. But uh, man, he buckled down. He threw the fastest pitches of his life in that game right there at the end of the season. Uh, you know, there's some fatigue going on. There's emotional stress going on, and he threw a pitch 98.4 miles an hour, which was the fastest pitch he's ever thrown. So that gives you an idea of what when adrenaline takes over and focus is laser, like he was great things happen. And he was, he was spot on. And the guy on the other side, Luis Garcia was good until he wasn't. And it shows you how, how one pitch can really just uh, undermine an entire effort. And then that's, what's so crazy about baseball, but Garcia, a rookie pitching on three days rest. Uh, another guy that saw a major VLO bump during the postseason, And obviously was riding on adrenaline on three days rest and running it up to you know, heights in terms of velo that he hadn't even reached in the regular season, he ends up giving up. And it was that Soler at bat where I looked over at my mom and I said, he's going to walk here or he's going to hit a ball 450 feet. You just could tell, you know, when you foul a bunch off, when a guy's just on it like that, I mean, you saw Garcia go to some of his best pitches and put him in good spots. And, and Soler was spoiling, 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 and then boom. And that was, that was just one of the most towering home runs I've seen in person. I know like the, the distance, I, I hardly believe it half the time. I feel like the, the ones that look like they're 600 feet or 390. And then the ones that are look like normal home runs end up going 480. But that, I think it was listed at what they say, 446 or something like that, which is still a bomb. But I mean, this guy has some different kind of power, but it seemed like after that swing, they did decide to pull Garcia and then it went to the bullpen and the Braves just wore out that bullpen that had been overachieving, uh, you know, most of the postseason. On the flip side, you had Freed that was cruising. Uh, what did you see from the Braves bats? I mean, you talk about getting hot at the right time. They undoubtedly did that. But it seemed like there just wasn't a break in the entire lineup. Whereas even with this Astros offense that is special, uh, and like we said, one of the best we've seen in a while, you get to the back of the order and you got Martin Maldonado, you got some weak hitters, uh, you know, the eight, nine hole can be a bit weak, especially when they lost Jake Myers in the outfield. They had, you know, revolving door of, of Chas McCormick or whoever else they wanted to put out there. Jose Siri eight, nine, wasn't as strong. 
the Braves, it seemed like there wasn't a single at bat where pitchers were getting a break. Well, and that's another thing we talked about is when you get contributions from one through nine in the lineup, uh, like we talked about the Giants, that was, I think, part of the reason of their success is they got contributions from so many places in the lineup. There was no hole. There was no, uh, like you just said, the sigh of relief where the pitcher's like, okay, I got a pretty easy stretch coming up here where these Atlanta hitters were, were every one of those guys had a huge hit in one of the postseason games. Crazy. You know, Danzy Swanson didn't really have that great a batting average the entire series, but he hit two of the biggest home runs that, that Atlanta Braves, uh, it might go down in history as two of the biggest home runs. So, um, and then, you know, Freddie Freeman just was consistent. He got on base. Uh, you know, he, he looked at that first seven strikeouts against the uh, Dodgers uh, when he was out in LA. And then from then on, man, he was as, as Freddie Freeman, as we've seen him, you know, he's just a great consistent performer, but um, you know, the pinch hits and uh, Soler coming up with big home runs. It's just, you know, it was their time. It was that kind of team effort that uh, you look at and appreciate, especially, you know, from someone like me that has been there in, in 2003. And I saw that kind of contributions up and down the entire lineup that the bullpen came in and did their job. Starting pitchers did their job. It was just a, a really, really great series for the Braves all the way around. And cool storylines as well. I mean, from Jock Peterson coming from L.A., um, obviously played with, a, with Chicago for a little bit of the season before getting traded and uh, just instantly becoming that fan favorite. And uh, someone like Tyler Matzik playing such a big role who was out of baseball just a couple years ago. I forget what he was doing. He, he was doing some, it was one of those Evan Gaddis type of stories, had a very normal person job and wasn't really focused on baseball. He makes his way back and plays a huge part uh, in their run and actually at their parade. I don't know if you saw this. He got no, stopped didn't. by police and got pulled aside because they thought he was a fan running in the uh, on the street <laughs> of the parade. And he was like, no, 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 like I'm, I'm Tyler Matzik. Um, but, you know, just such an awesome, awesome story for some of those guys. And then for Freeman, too. I mean, Freddie Freeman's one of baseball's good guys. Uh, I think they, there's not a person out there that'll say something bad about Freddie Freeman. Even Marlins fans love Freddie Freeman. And that's when you know, because I know Marlins fans were very much not happy. At least the ones that I ha uh, follow and see on Twitter were, were very much rooting for the Astros and the rest of America wasn't. Uh, so that's when you know, you know, people were happy for Freddie Freeman, who now is going to be a free agent, quote unquote, because I think it's absolutely insane uh, to think that he won't be back there. But he's in a unique spot as a free agent. And that's what I wanted to talk about with the contracts now, because we're heading into a loaded free agent class. And as we've talked about off the air before, it, it, times are different. Uh, and we've talked about it on the show, too, where guys just get so much more money nowadays and, it, and, and they get more long term commitments in terms of years. And it, it's crazy stuff. These big contracts rarely pan out. Uh, you know, at least to the way that you would imagine when you're giving somebody $300 million and we can go over all of the examples of how they haven't worked out very well. Um, I think everybody's very aware of that, but we're not, not enough to deter teams from doing it because there's always going to be one team that's willing to take the risk. And that's the ironic part of all of this. Before we get into like some specific players and I want to talk a little bit about like Freddie Freeman and you know his whole career potentially with one team, what do you think about the, the money side of it? I mean, do you think we ever start going back to more shorter term contracts with higher annual value? Or are we always going to be doing this thing where we give guys eight years and, and pray that it's not going to be like all the other ones that don't go well? I mean, listen, uh, I was a player, so I'm on the pro player side here. I'm with the player association and we went on strike a couple of times to fight for what, rules they have in place right now. But as you know, the CBA is coming up for a negotiation this off season. And everyone that I've talked to that knows anything about the situation says it's going to be ugly. And at some point, I think, you know, cooler heads must prevail and know that players are going to be well compensated. Uh, the game, it, it has to, there has to be a, a point where the salaries have to stop escalating so crazily high. I mean, it, it's out of control right now not out of control, but it's going to outpace earnings at some point. So you're going to see a pullback. And like you said, someone's always going to give that, that eight year deal of, with the absurd money. So all it takes one off season is for someone to say, no, I, I can't afford that. This is my business plan. This is my, 
um, what I have to give for free agents and, and going forward. And I don't have the money to give Kyle Seeger eight years uh, for 300 plus million. I can give him five, but I can't give him eight. Um, so I think we're going to see probably going back a little bit backwards as far as length of deals are concerned, just because, you know, and you're playing and it's proven. I mean, you go through all the stats and the players 37 to 41 year old seasons, they just aren't worth what they're getting paid. No, not at all. And it's also a product of, you don't know what's going to happen with your team. And you have other players that start coming up that you want to pay. And now you're, you've got your hands tied because you legitimately cannot afford to keep some of the other players. And when you were with the Marlins, the Marlins, and, and this was in a, the front office role, the Marlins made that move and they gave a big contract to John Carlos Stanton. And you know what? It was, it was the right move because if they didn't, somebody else was going to do it. And I thought it was, it was a good sign to Marlins fans and unfortunately, it didn't work out with the team. If the team was winning, you know, who knows how it all would have ended up. But when you're not winning and now you have a star that's quite often injured and missing a lot of time, no other team really wants to take on that deal. And, and when we saw the ownership switch over, that was one of the first things that the new ownership wanted to do is get out from under that contract. And it was a hard one to move. There's only a few teams that were willing to do it. And of course, the New York Yankees were one of them. When you see that kind of deal for John Carlos Stanton, it's, it's not really a question as to whether he deserves it because he was playing out of his mind and he had a great year this year. It's not about whether he deserves it, but for a small market team, especially, is it really possible for small market teams to be able to do that? I mean, we, we saw how much it, it was difficult for the Marlins in that situation. Like are, are big contracts going to be something that really makes the game more polarizing where small market teams can never do it. Or when they have that one special guy, is it possible to make that money work still? Not really. I mean, when yeah. you look at a, like when you look at a Tampa Bay, uh, Oakland athletics, when you look at a Miami Marlins, those bottom of the run uh, revenue teams that listen, they only generate X amount of dollars per year and they can't feasibly go after a free agent that might be, a third or a half of their payroll, their entire payroll yeah, for one guy. I mean, it's just it's not possible. So we've, we've locked it. We looked at, we talked about the A's and the, the Rays and how they have gotten away with um, superior scouting, superior development uh, at these low payroll levels. I mean, the Tampa Bay Rays won the net or American league East this year with a, like a 65 or $70 million payroll, which was yeah. a, a quarter of what the Dodgers paid and a third of what the Yankees were at. So you know, it can be done. It can be done. You just have to have a, have a system in place um, that procures your talent and gets them up to the big leagues and is productive, which someone should be analyzing those two organizations uh, up and down and saying, what are these guys doing that we're not? Because they're, they do it every year. And it's crazy how it, they're not emulated more uh, throughout baseball. Absolutely. And I think the Giants are a great example of that too. And um I can't believe when you asked me what we're talking about, I totally, totally slipped my mind to mention that we should talk about Buster Posey, uh, who, who decided to, to call it quits at, I believe it's what, age 35 now, or not even age 35 yet. I mean, you know, the wear and tear at the catching position. And, and this just came to my mind as we were talking about teams, because the Giants are a team that they spent more money than some of those small market teams, but not all in one player. It wasn't one big mega deal to one guy they looked at it like, you know, you got to spread out your money and, and try to make as balanced of a roster as possible. A couple more things I want to talk about with the, the 90s Braves and, and the three-headed monster that they had there. But I also want to quickly wrap up with your thoughts on Buster Posey because I love to hear from a player, you know, any major league player, but especially you, just their thoughts on somebody else that did something uh, so well that they both did, you know, like to, to be able to appreciate the way he played. I feel like nobody can appreciate it better than his peers. And I don't think you overlapped with him at all. Right. But you, you not a, just missed him, I think by a year or two. Right. But yeah, I was 07 retired and he was rookie in 09. 09. So by a year or two, but just as someone who played uh, at, the, at the major league level for a long time, I think you can appreciate uh, what kind of player he was, uh, both on and off the field. I, I would just love to hear some of your thoughts on on what Buster Posey uh, was able to do in just such a short time because he, he didn't go the Yachty, 
you know, longevity route, he dominated for, you know, 12 years um, and then showed us all at the end that he could keep going if he wanted to, but he doesn't want to. Yeah. You know what? Uh, one of the few guys that got to play his entire career with one team um, and, you know, they've got a special fan base there in San Francisco uh, in that new stadium. It's been phenomenal to uh, go to the games. They, they sell out most every home game and uh, they really stand behind their players that they love. And he's one of the most adored players in that organization's history. And, you know, we're talking about a catcher that had a 302 career batting average. Um, obviously, he didn't get, catch as much the last few years. But uh, when he was in the meat of his catching duties, this guy's winning a batting championship. He hit 336 one year, which, you know, uh, as we know, and as I, I am now looking when I was with the Marlins and, and now I'm looking at uh, FIU for catchers, you know, catchers are a rare breed. And if you can get one that can hit as well, it's uh, like staggering how quickly those guys can get to the big leagues is because it, it's, it's a, a, a rare thing to have is a, a power hitting catcher or a, just a, a hitting catcher for that matter. So he was special. He was a special player and, and one of the sweetest swings you're ever going to see. And, uh, I didn't know Buster Posey, um, but from what I hear about uh, other guys talking about him as teammates and things like that, they say he's first class all the way. And and you know what? It's it's uh, refreshing to see that you know he's had his time and he got yeah. to spend uh, his entire career with um, one organization. And you know Buster Posey might have some problems, but money's not one of them. So you know he earned a cool 170 million in his career. Yeah, uh, this is not going to be a money grab. You know, he's not going to stay around to try and get an extra contract to pile some more money on. I mean, the guy's got more money than he'll ever know what to do with. So uh, kudos to him to say, you know what, I've had enough. Um, it's probably time for my family to step away right now and and to enjoy uh, their life, because as baseball players, we're gone a lot. And it's uh, seven and a half months of the, of the year are spent with our other family. And that's the baseball team. That's one of the things that's really stuck with me, you know, since since I've talked to you over the years. And, you know, I remember when I first asked you about ever managing, just never really thinking about the human component to it as much of just, you know, your, your instant answer was like, I, I was away from my family enough through the years. That's not something I'd want to do. And it totally made sense. It's just, you don't think about it. You're only thinking about them on the field. You don't realize that to be on that field, you have to be away from your family so frequently and travel so much. And, uh, when I when I saw Posey come back this year, I know a lot of people I was caught off guard still, but I wasn't totally shocked because of that conversation I had with you. I, I saw Buster Posey opt out last year because his, he adopted two two girls and I believe it was two girls, but I know for sure two children. And he enjoyed spending the time with his wife. And he ended up saying in that press conference that a big reason why he was sure going into this year that it would be the last was because of that 2020 where he opted out and spent time with his family. I'm sure it made it even harder to get, get away again for a whole year. Uh, what's amazing is that kind of hinted at the fact that he knew going into the year that that was it, but he didn't want his farewell tour. Uh, he didn't want he's not that kind of player. Of show. He, he's kind of that humble guy that uh, doesn't want the spotlight to be on him. It's about the team and uh, you got to take your hats off to that and really admire him for doing that absolutely absolutely and I, I just wanted to get a little bit of your thoughts on him and of course naturally in the toxic world that is social media and sports it's we've spurred into a Buster Posey Hall of Fame debate uh, there is no debate in my opinion um, I know that a lot of people you have to have that that longevity but I think if you dominate for 12 years uh, it's just something that I'm, I'm more of a believer of if you can dominate your stretch at your position and win the world series and do all those things, I think that can compensate for the lack of longevity, but it, it's an interesting conversation there too. And we are going to have probably one of the more wild uh, hall of fame voting, uh, I guess, just years this, this year <laughs> that we've ever had. It's the final year of Barry Bonds on the ballot. A rod joins the ballot. Uh, it's going to be a mess. Final year of Roger Clemens, I believe. So Final year of Roger Clemens. Final year of uh, Kurt Schilling. That saga continues on. It's going to be a mess. Yeah. And we can just sit here and just watch it all and talk about it. Because <laughs> it's going to be, I'm glad I don't have to vote. I really am. Because my dream is to be able to vote. And I'm so glad that I don't have to vote this year. I just uh, don't but, understand. I just don't understand the, the people that have 
not voted for those guys for 14 years. Are you going to flip a vote just because they're last year of eligibility and say, oh, yeah, now we've, we've made now. them sweat long enough. We've made them agonize long enough. So now I'm going to say yes. And you can you can go in now because I hold that vote. I mean, I, I've never understood that either. The guy's numbers aren't going to change. And I don't know how often the voters in uh, the media, how often that there's turnover in there. Does one guy hold a vote for their, his whole life? I don't know how that works. I don't know how many new voters have come in since Barry Bonds got on the, on the ballot 14 years ago. That's so, a good point. Uh, I just don't see it being overturned right now. At this point, you got like 64% or 62% or something like that. There's a significant amount of people that have to change their minds on him and Clemens this last year to get them into the hall. So um, it is going to be interesting. It's going to be and very interesting. And, and David Ortiz, too. I think we'll be joining the ballot, which is another interesting one because he, he doesn't have the suspension tied to it, but he does have, uh, you know, reports with his name in it and, and the Mitchell report listing him. So it's going to be very, very fascinating to see how that all uh, unfolds. But I do think it's, it's a great point of, okay, if you didn't vote for the guy for a decade plus, how do you just say, all right, you know, now, now's the time. Uh, I'm going to throw him a bone now. I don't know. Yeah. I don't get, I don't get the change of heart there. It's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty cut and dry type of thing. And, and that's the, one of the things I like about the baseball hall of fame is how difficult it is to crack. I think it's objectively the hardest hall of fame uh, to get into, unless you're like a wide receiver in football, that's, it's a weird quirk in the NFL hall of fame, but that's what makes baseball what it is. But there's this level of inconsistency now where we're seeing because of all these gray areas that it, it is a little bit messy, but some of the guys that were not, very messy and there wasn't much question to their hall of fame status was a trio of pitchers in Atlanta that you had to face a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And with the Braves winning the world series, I I just thought about it. And I was like, we got to talk about those nineties Braves because you had to deal with them quite often. And you know what? They only won the one world series. I mean, when we talk about what the Marlins had done in that time span, even if you go from, you know, 95 up until last year, technically the Marlins had, you know, more championship success. Yet the Marlins have never won a division title. The Braves won 14 in a row and they only had the one World Series to show for it up until this past championship. We'll get into why they came up short in a little bit if there is any explanation in that, on that. But I would love to just talk to you about the Braves and that team uh, that, you know, there was turnover, but one of the constants was the three-headed monster that you had to deal with. And all I can think about is how many times did you have to go into a series, three-game set, and you got, in whatever order, Glavin, Smoltz, Maddox, uh, back to back to back. And you just got to be like, oh, well, this is going to be fun. Well, I mean, you know, you have to line up where you're going in the series with one, two, three, which thank goodness that didn't happen all the time because we'd get Oh, uh, Steve Avery sometimes, or we get, you know, they had other great pitchers on their staff that just didn't happen to end with uh, those three. But, you know, when you can keep uh, a pitching staff together for that long, Maddox was the, uh, the, the shortest tenured of the Braves stint with those guys. He was there for 11 years, Glavin 16 years, and Smoltz was 20 with one organization. I didn't know, you know that until you just told me that. To the very, very end, he pitched for one team when he was 42, I think Boston for a little bit and, and some of, but for Same 20 years of his career, he stayed in Atlanta, which is uh, remarkable. And uh, Glavin, uh, until he went to the Mets for the last three or four years, he was with Atlanta for the majority of his career. So they laid a foundation there with those pit, that pitching staff and Bobby Cox as a manager that I think was, John Scherholz was the genius uh, GM behind that whole team, which he was in Kansas City when I was coming up as a Royal. Uh, then he went to Atlanta after that and built those championship Royals teams in the 80s. So this guy had a pedigree of, of constructing an organization and laying the groundwork for a lot of success for future to come. And he did it with the Braves. And uh, when you start with uh, a guy like Bobby Cox and people ask me um, a lot, you know, toward the end of my career, was there anybody that you'd really enjoy playing for? And I always said that I'd love to play for Bobby Cox someday because yeah. everything I heard about him um, was just, I, everything was great. Every player loved the guy, you know, they loved playing for him and he let them play the game. Um, and, and it was just one of those managers that, you know, I'm like, dang, I really admired him from across the field and I, I would have liked to have been on one of his teams. So 
if, if, you know, and I don't think anybody debates how great Bobby Cox was, but to hear that from a player who, who never even played with him to say, you know, Bobby Cox was one hell of a manager and you look at how talented those teams are and what they were able to do year in and year out. Why do you think they weren't able to really pull it off outside of 95 and, and how were they able, or how were they coming up empty so many times? Was it just bad luck or, or what, what was it? You know, were they similar to the Dodgers where they just, you know, choke uh, at the end every year being that I wasn't alive for most of the nineties. I'm very curious on you know what the general perspective is on that. If it was just a little bit of bad luck or what the deal was. Well, that's, that's baseball. You know, we've talked about that too, where the best team doesn't normally win the world series. Uh, it's the hottest team. So the Braves were, they're hot going in because they're, they, they win every division championship every single year. I don't know how many times they won hundred games, but it was a bunch and they're always in the mid to upper nineties. So they're winning a lot of baseball games during the season. And then when they get to the postseason, I don't know, I think it was an energy too with their crowds. Their crowds are very lackluster about when you came in there for a playoff series, they're like, all right, let's get these guys out of the way. Let's get to the next one. And we ended up beating them because that's the feeling we got when we went to the Yankees in the World Series. It was kind of like, oh, here's the Marlins. and eh, Marlins, there, nothing. Let's get on with this and just collect our trophy and, and uh, put another uh, notch in the belt. Well, that energy and that attitude, I think, helped us out both times. And we beat the Braves and we beat the, the Yankees because they're so used to winning that it's almost like, all right, uh, let's just get to the next level. And I don't know if that happened to the players, if they got that vibe and they got that energy that just like, Hey, we're really good. We're really good. And all season long, and now we're just going to steamroll to the world series, but it, it just didn't happen very often for the Braves. It's crazy because one of the things that you said going into the postseason uh, that I, I totally agree with is that you, you got to have those three pitchers. Generally, that's a really good start to, to making a run. And they had those three, and I just don't know how you can lose a series, especially in the, in the early going when it's best of five, but even when it's best of seven, when you've got those three guys going for you. Uh, and like you said, it's not like the other guys that they would have in there and the fourth and fifth spots were, were slouches, but the three Hall of Famers, that's a pretty good start. And then you also had, there was a little bit of lineup turnover, but a core of Chipper Jones, Andrew Jones a little bit later, uh, but then they would even bring in guys like Andres Galarraga, who hit 44 home runs for them. And uh, they had even David Ryan Justice. Klesko. Yeah, Justice. Uh, Kenny Lofton in the earlier parts of the 90s. Uh, Javi Lopez was unreal behind the dish. I mean, they just had so many guys that could swing it uh, that it was it was a lot of fun even just to go back and watch some of the video and, and go back and look at the stats. Fred McGriff, McGriff, too. McGriff as well. I mean, they just churned out these hitters uh and and it was it was crazy to me that, that they were not, not able to do it a little bit more but at the same time how many 100 win seasons they won 106 and 98 uh just nothing but insane domination and at least they did have the one championship to show for it because a lot of teams you know you, you talk about the braves oh, like electricity and energy and and how they were there every year so that was lacking a little bit it seemed like the total opposite this year I don't know if you noticed that. I've noticed it even in Houston in the Braves section. They realized, I think, how many times they got close and came up short, and they didn't take the playoff appearances for granted anymore. I mean, you, you saw those games at Truist Park. It was electric. It was electric. Uh, you could see the, the desperation in the fans. You hadn't really seen that in a long time, I think, from the Braves fans, right? I mean, th that was something that was a bit different, and it seemed like the team fed off of that, which is ironic given – you know, what you were saying about how it seemed like the, the converse of that uh, with the old Braves. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that place was uh, absolutely crazy. It might've been one of the loudest stadiums I've heard while well, on TV anyway, I wasn't there yeah, personally, absolutely. but uh, it was crazy loud, but you know, you bring up a good point when you've got a team that's dominated all year long and they coast into the playoffs, they're kind of, kind of even giving some guys rest the last 10 days, you know, yeah. they're oh, making sure everyone's healthy and everyone they're trying to line up their pitching rotation where, you know, I was a wild card team twice. We're fighting our tails off to the very end so we can make the playoffs. I mean, that's our goal is to make the playoffs. We had to fight to the last day of the season, a couple of years just to do that. So we've got all this hunger and momentum building toward the end of the season where these guys are kind of coasting the last week of the season because they're trying to get their rotation right. And well, the Braves this year, they only won 88 games. And they had to play hard until the last week of the season because 
any swing one way or the other. They lose two or three in a row. The Phillies win two or three in a row. And then we got a different, we got a whole different scenario uh, that uh, of who's making it to the playoffs. So I think that had a big, uh, a big part in how and why the Braves did so well this postseason. I, I agree a hundred percent. And we flipped to the Houston side because you were a part of a world series team on, on multiple occasions that after you won, uh, unfortunately, they got dismantled. And we've talked about that on previous episodes as well. Uh, sometimes it's a money thing. Sometimes the team just can't quite get back to where they were. And everybody wants a piece of that winning team. So even those average players, so to speak, that played well in that stretch, they might become a little bit more expensive. Uh, and that just seems to be what happens. And it, it might happen to a smaller degree with the Braves. I mean, we saw Jock Peterson decline his option. We're going to see Solaire probably get a little bit of a pay raise, whether it's with the Braves or elsewhere. Same with Eddie Rosario. It's just the way it is. But on the Astros side, they made a half-hearted offer to Carlos Correa, who had probably the best season of his career this year. It's going to, going to win the gold glove at shortstop. I believe that's going to come out tonight, actually. So by the time it comes out, uh, this episode will be released after it already came out. So hopefully I'm not wrong on that one. Correa should win by every stretch and had a spectacular offensive season. It's hard to envision Correa anywhere other than Houston, but they offered him a deal. That's just not, he's not going to take. It's a non-starter at about 160 million. I believe it was over five years, if I'm not mistaken. It's crazy to say that that's a non-starter, but it's a non-starter. Uh, he might walk now. And I'd say 90% chance he walks. Is it, I'm trying to think of the way to phrase this. If you're the Astros and you've been getting to that point so many times over the last few years, and that's a main part in Carlos Correa, he's a main part of your team. How can you possibly let your shortstop walk? Is there a way you've got to find the way to make the money work? Like, how are they okay with letting this player walk? And how much do you think that can impact this Astros team that just came up short and now is going to try to get back there again? Could we see that fall from grace a little bit that happens from the championship hangover when you lose? Well it's totally possible because, you know, you've got superstars on that Astros team and keeping superstars together costs a great deal of money. Yeah. Uh, they've been able to do that since 2016, 2017, they've kept this core group of guys together. Well, they get more and more expensive every single year. So at some point, the ownership has got to say, we can't afford this anymore. We can't afford to go any higher. We're going to start losing money because I think people uh, lose sight of the fact that baseball is a business and the ownership, they're in it to make money first and foremost. So when you've got a guy like Carlos, Carlos Correa, who obviously is uh, one of the, the best players in the game, um, in order to sign him, am I going to take a loss on my team profit-wise? Or if I don't sign him, I'm going to make some money. So it, it's a tough situation because winning obviously brings in fans and that creates a atmosphere at your ballpark that's different than anywhere else when they're not winning. And uh, it's a sticky situation, but, you know, I don't know who else is up for contract. I don't think anybody else is a free agent on that team. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Um, they don't, I don't know if they can afford doubling his salary and, and keeping that team together. How often did you see that happen outside of, of your situation? Because I know with the Marlins, it's kind of a stigma with them at this point was that they would win and they'd get dismantled no matter who the owner was. It was, it just happened on multiple occasions. And that's what happens with small market teams in general. I mean, I think we're going to see the Oakland athletics, even though they didn't win it, uh, they're going to start trading pieces away uh, this off season. Uh, I'm fairly positive about that. How often did you feel like that happened? Cause you say superstars are, are tough to, to keep and keep together. Usually when you win the championship, a bunch of stars become stars or, or budding stars become stars. And then it's hard to keep them. How often did you feel like, a World Series team uh, would tend to dismantle a year or two after because of the money side of things or because players would want to go do their own thing. I feel like a dynasty is just so rare in baseball. That's what made the Giants special for that stretch of however many years. Uh, but how often do you, did you really see uh, the team stick together that long uh, through your playing days or, or even a little bit before that? Well, you automatically look at the, the major markets because they have the payrolls, they have the flexibility, they get the revenues to be able to keep a team together for a long time. Um, small market teams just can't do that. You know, and, and in 97, we kind of opened up the, the pocketbooks for the Marlins and, and spent a decent amount of money. We ended up winning the World Series. Well, 
at that point, I think Wayne Huizinga was just, baseball is not going to work here in South Florida. We're, we're just never going to turn that corner and get back to, you know, 40,000 sellouts every night and he's going to make a lot of money. So he decided to blow up a team and get rid of everybody. So that was a legit sell-off. That is a legit, I'm throwing a grenade on this thing and we're, we're cutting everything. But in 03, you know, I think people think that, oh, we blew up the team just because, you know, Pudge was on a one-year contract. Um, Derek Lee was a free agent. Um, and I think Jeffrey Loria did actually a great job. We had good teams in 04 and 05. Two years, oh, those two years I remember that. after the World Series, we kept some stuff together and we should have done better than we did. We should have made the playoffs, I think, both those years. Uh, you know, we lose Derek Lee, but he goes out and signs Carlos, Carlos Delgado as a free agent. I mean, yep. geez, that's huge. That's a huge sign for us. And he didn't disappoint. He had 38 home runs and 100 plus RBIs. I mean, that's a that's a big time superstar that we got. So well, when they say, oh, we, you know, we keep on blowing teams up. I don't think that was the case after 03. We had two legitimate shots both those years uh, to get back to the playoffs. And we just uh, we fell apart. We didn't do it. I think you bring up a great point. I mean, the pitching was there. You still had a lot of the same guys from that rotation, uh, including the, the horse with Josh Beckett. You had Willis getting better every year. Uh, you had a young star in the making in Miguel Cabrera. So you had those pieces that were getting better on your team already. And I think that you bring up a really good point. It's easy to forget that the Marlins went out and signed Delgado uh, ahead of that 05 season. And like you said, he was great. I, I remember being really excited about that as a kid like oh my gosh they're gonna get back there again and that I will argue that aside from the World Series teams I would argue that on paper that 05 team I'd put up with any team in Marlins history in terms of the talent I've said that time and time again the talent on that 05 team top to bottom I would put up with any almost any team that the Marlins have had because it just was almost the bones of that 03 team, maybe a little bit more than that, with some added pieces and some improved young talent. I, I think you bring up a really good point there. And after two years of not getting in, I think that's the difference with the big and the small markets, right? Is the, the big markets, they can struggle for a couple of years and they can they can handle that, right? Like they can handle the financial distress of a couple bad years with a high payroll. The small market teams they can only give it two goes and then it's, it's, you got to throw in the towel and start over. And I, I think that's the difference. Cause I think of the Yankees and when they had to share on his way out and they had Beltron slowing down and even Matsui and some of those other guys that were on big deals that were slowing down at the end, they were okay with that. Like they, they could ride it out. And, and we saw them do just that uh, for a couple years. And most other teams would have to burn it down. Uh, I want to get to this Jersey and then wrap up with a little bit of FIU talk to hear the latest about what's going on over there. First, let's get to the Jersey because I see and a reminder. I always try to remind everybody, uh, but in case you're new to the show, you are also able to watch these episodes over on YouTube at just baseball media. And you can see uh, the jerseys as well as Jeff's very cool backdrop. Uh, what do we got here? Is that a Rockies jersey? I see purple piping. It can, it can only be a couple. Blue. blue. Is that blue? Yeah. Okay. My eyes are playing tricks on me. Is that going to be Braves then? Nope. Nope. Any relation to anything happening recently in baseball? You typically do that. No. Nope. Uh, sometimes this you just, just pull a, one out. Of, sometimes you pull random one, out. one I decided to pick out for today. It's, it has nothing to do with anything. All right. What's the team? And then I'll, I'll go for the player. Ah, Mets. Okay, we're breaking out the Mets again. We already did Glavin, even though he was a Met for like a minute. That was always the name I thought because maybe you overlapped with him. Gosh, Mets. David Wright. Wow. Wow. That, that was impressive. I'm going to give myself a pat on the back as you spin around there. You got a long note from David Wright. You know what it says? Do you remember what it says? I can't remember, but it was, uh, he was probably one of my favorite teammates, even though I only had him for a month. Um, that guy was special. He was special that organization. He was special that city. And it was just uh, awful what happened with him health wise. You know, we talked about these long-term contracts and, you know, this guy was a superstar. He was going to be one of the Mets greatest third baseman of all time. And his back gave out on him. He just couldn't do it because he had some monster seasons with the Mets and, uh, but, Stand-up guy, New York media. He stood in front of that locker every single night. 
and answered all these tough questions about uh, our team and how we collapsed at the end. And, and uh, he was the dude. He was a dude in New York and, uh, you know, great teammate, great guy. And I wish that, um, you know, he could have ended, not even ended, just, just played a healthy 15 years, whatever he was going to do uh, and see what those numbers would have been because uh, we might be talking about his induction to the Hall of Fame too. I, I agree 100%. And that's another player where you just hear nothing but good things, nothing but good things, whether it's from, you or media member or former teammates or anything that I've ever heard about David Wright is always positive. And you're spot on about, about the hall of fame. I think if he was able to continue playing, I mean, through 2006 to 2013, he only missed the all-star game once made the all-star game every single year besides that. And he really up until 2014. So until his age 31 season, then he never really played more than 30 games. Those final couple of years, he had over 1,700 hits at that point, at age 31, 32. So at that point, you're thinking he's got an outside shot at getting close to 3,000. He probably would have finished in the 2,500 to 2,700 range. He was a 296 career hitter, he had 242 homers. He did a little bit of everything. He even stole more, almost 200 backs, played good defense. I mean, this guy just did it all. It's really tough when you see guys not able to go out on their own terms and uh, especially at 31 years old there. Uh, but you, I remember you also mentioning that he kind of got out in front when you guys had that horrible collapse and he was the one that kind of wore a little bit of it, right? Like he was the face of the team and, or one of the faces of the team. And when the Mets came up short in 07, it was 07, right? That, yep. that was him taken a lot of the brunt of it right it taken a lot of the questions it was mostly going through him 100 percent. he was the guy you know and like i said uh, he would stand there and then take them all a lot of guys would hide in the food room or run to the training room and because they don't want to deal with the new york media which it's tough it's tough they're there just buzzing around all the time looking for that bad story to write um but he just stood there and answered the questions and he was the go-to guy for that team you were the new guy you weren't there that long you didn't get too much too much flack there right no, I mean, I was just a, a piece to, you know, try to get a pinch hit here or there. I didn't play much in that, that month of the, uh, the season when I was there, but it was, it's a great experience playing in New York. And, um, you know, I was really excited to possibly get the opportunity to play in the playoffs in New York, but it didn't happen. Uh, I'm sure Mets fans were just as excited, but they've got a lot to sort out this off season too. And they have a front office job that nobody wants, which is pretty crazy. Because it's New York, it's a big market. You have an owner that's literally saying, I will open up the checkbook and nobody wants the job. I feel like that says a lot about the organization at this point. If you have New York deep pockets of, from your owner and nobody wants the job. That says a lot. I mean, that should be one of the most coveted jobs in baseball, but it's right. not... It's not. And there's a lot of managerial openings. There's going to be a lot of moving around. I thought a very low key switch up was Bob Melvin going from Oakland over to San Diego. We talked about it in the past before we go over to FIU. I just wanted your thoughts on, on that because we talk about manager influence uh, and we talked about some of the issues that we saw in San Diego with, you know, some teammates getting after it with each other, a bad collapse. You think that Bob Melvin move was to just to try to treat just that, to, to try to get these personalities all in check and to try to have that right leader at the helm. Could that be what's missing from this Padres team? Do you think Bob Melvin could end up being a big tide turner for them? It could be. I mean, I played with Bob Melvin in Kansas City uh, briefly. And, you know, when he uh, went into Oakland and did a phenomenal job in Oakland with all those teams, and he's just a low key kind of guy that, like you said, I think he's a good manager of personalities and he's a good calming force within a clubhouse. So he might do wonders for those young guys in uh, San Diego. And you might see a big, I mean, they're on pace to, it was them and the Dodgers. We, we knew that. We talked about that early on. And uh, they kind of tripped up and never got up again. They, they had a monumental uh, collapse. But Bo, Bo Mel is going to be a, a good spot for that organization, a good guy to, to lead them into the next year. Well, FIU has a couple of good guys between – yourself and Merville Melendez to help lead the program there. And you only have about 10 more days until 
the guys get to get on break and relax a little bit. And you're going to hope that they're getting after it and stuff like that. But then they come back after holiday break and you've got a little over a month until the season starts. That's going to sneak up on us pretty quick. I feel like, uh, how's it going? Just checking in. How's it going with, with everything so far? I know you're loving it. Uh, but how has it been just the experience now that you're a little bit more of into a groove now you're several months or two months, three months in, how long have you been doing this now? Well, I mean, I signed with the team, uh, early June, but we didn't get the players until I didn't meet them until August, August 24th. And we didn't start workouts till a uh, day after labor day. So, um, it's been going great. You know, it, it's a, a good bunch of guys and they have been working really hard and, um, the improvement I've seen in just a short period of time, uh, has been phenomenal. And, um, you know, I don't know what to compare it to right now because I haven't seen other teams in the conference or anything, but I think, you know, we're going to have a good offense. Uh, we got some good arms, good arms out of the bullpen. It could be a fun year. It could be a really fun year. And I think the guys, if they feel that they feel like it's been a, a little different vibe this year than in years past, just because of how well, um, and I've heard the coaches say, this is the best this team has looked in really? the fall in their memory. So, uh, tribute to the kids because they've been working hard and um, you know, they're sponges. They want to learn like every single day. They've just been wanting to learn, which, you know, as a coach, you can't ask for anything more than that. Of course. And it, a, a lot of returners this year or a lot of new guys, a little bit of super both. young team, you know, they had a lot of injuries last year and they ended up having four or five freshmen starting last year, wow. which is really difficult to have in a decent conference, not even a decent conference. They had four teams ranked in the top 25 last year. So it's a very wow. good conference. Um, so now those guys have a year under their belts. Uh, so they're going to come in and be coming in as sophomores. Uh, it's still a young team. Um, we'll probably only have one starter as a senior. Uh, we got a couple juniors out there, but most of them are sophomores um, that are going to be, you know, here with us this year and, and hopefully next year. And I'm pretty sure we're going to have a couple kids drafted uh, after their junior year, but um, we're looking good. Could be fun. It's always a good problem to have, right? I mean, you get players drafted. It's, you're excited for them and it means that they did quite well for you, but if they don't get drafted, you're happy to have them back as well. It's, it's one of those unique spots as, as a coach. When I think what's hard with baseball too, is you want to recruit the best high school talent possible as well. But sometimes you recruit high school talent that's too good and they don't even make it to your campus. I know you've been involved a little bit in the recruiting side of things too. I'm curious what that whole process is like. Uh, and I don't know if it's too early for you, uh, but when you're recruiting players, knowing that there's a chance, there's no other sport where you deal with that, you know, basketball, you have to play the year in college. Now there's a little bit of that difficulty where they could go play in the, in the G league or go do some other things because there's alternative options uh, to forfeit your, your amateurism. But with baseball, it's pretty unique in that you could recruit some guys and they make some major strides in the showcase circuit and, or have a really big summer. And all of a sudden now they're on draft radars and, you could lose a recruit and it shakes up your whole class. Right. I mean, how, how does that, how does that work from a coaching standpoint? Um, have you kind of just been learning on the fly? Have you, like, how do you, how do you learn that process? Or is it just kind of one of those things that you, everybody kind of goes flies by the seat of their pants a little bit, I guess. Well, I mean, you're looking at guys that um, obviously the best possible players you can get um, as a mid major school, you know, you're not one of the big five conferences that, uh, a lot of these kids covet, um, but we do have a lot of exposure at FIU. We're a good team. So um, there's all kinds of things that can happen. So you're doing on projectability. I've been, I was out looking at 2024 grads uh, this summer and I saw a couple of kids I really liked and we made offers to, but you know, they're so young, they're 15, 16 years old. They're like, wow, this is so new to them. They're getting offers. It, it's exciting. Uh, they want to wait to see what else is out there, which is totally fine. You, you, you know, you got to explore all your options. So um, you never know because they can decommit. They can say at some point, like, sorry, I don't want to play for you anymore because, uh, I think Florida likes me and who's not going to go to Florida if they can, or UF or FSU or, uh, one of the big giant programs. But, um, and at the same time for us as a school, what if they don't get any better? You know, they don't improve at all. I, I got this kid at 16 years old at 15. I think he's going to be a great baseball player. He projects well, but maybe he doesn't, maybe he gets worse and you feel bad. Like, I'm sorry, but you're, you haven't improved like we thought you were going to. We don't, we can't, we're not going to have a spot for you anymore. So you have to tell those kids sometimes that. So it's tough. Uh, it's tough, but um, 
in the end, you, you know, you hope you just get uh, a great talent that, that you can work with and, and make them better. It, that's the really amazing part is we talk about how teams in the major league level, they have to give out the eight year contracts because somebody else will. I feel like with college offers, none of you guys want to offer a sophomore. I mean, right in a perfect world, you would just put, put out all your offers when guys were going into their senior years because you'd have a better idea of where they're at, but you have to offer them sophomore year now because other people will. And if you don't come in until the end of junior year, it could be too late. Right. Is that kind of where we've gotten with recruiting? Cause I feel like kids are getting offered younger and younger and younger these days. And that's my only hypothesis on it. That's the collegiate uh, version of an eight-year deal is that yeah. they're trying to get them before anybody else does. And like, oh, wow, look at all this. And then hopefully they say yes, you know, and, but it's still not a binding contract. You know, there's yeah. no, there's nothing that says you have to go to that school when you say yes, verbally, it's a verbal commitment only until you sign that national letter of intent in your senior year, that's when it becomes a binding contract. And then that's when you have to go to that school. But up until then, you just don't know. Yeah, that's that's the wild thing about it. You see more turnover in other sports and football and basketball. You'll see some of these kids commit and decommit from like three different schools. And that always blows my mind. I'm like, I'm not making that decision until I'm really sure. But it's also a crazy thing to expect a 15 or 16 year old or sometimes even younger than that to make a decision for their, you know, 18, 19 into their early 20s uh, that could have a huge effect and impact on the rest of their life. It's it's a pretty wild concept that there really is no other way to do it though at the same time so it's it's always been something that fascinates me and and on Griffin's side of course your son he was a little bit of a late bloomer and a lot of his offers came in towards the end of of his recruiting cycle I guess it would be right and I mean that was the unique part about it too and I think that's what kind of helped him make the best decision because I think what's really interesting about Griffin is that he was set to go to Rice he he wanted to play at rice right and, and you if i'm not mistaken and, and miss conine nudged him to go check out duke before he made his final decision right well we went to rice and did the whole um tour and everything and then at the very end the guy the recruiting coordinator says all right let's go talk money and i'm like i did not expect an offer that day at all i didn't know what to expect but he writes down on a piece of paper and slides it over and i looked at it and i'm like holy crap that's a legitimate offer like wow so we got in the car and I told Griffin what he was and what it was. And he's like, wow, we got back home that night. And, you know, Cindy asked how to go. And he goes, I'm going to Rice. You know, I'm like, <laughs> wait a second. You know, you had two schools where we already had planned visits to go. This was on a Monday. I think we had Duke and Wake Forest back to back on Friday. So I'm like, hey, you got to go visit. Let's just to see, you know, and he goes, all right, I'll go visit to eliminate them, you know, process of elimination. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, when we're, we're departing from Wake Forest to come back home, I said, all right, rank them for me right now. And he said, Duke, Wake Forest, Rice. <laughs> that was his rankings. And I'm like, whoa, okay. You know, before on Monday, it was Rice. So I'm going to Rice. And then by Friday, he, they're in third place. So he didn't sure really think he didn't really think that campus, the campus would make that much of a difference, you know. But when you walk on Duke's campus and oh. see that it's just like, wow, I get, I might get to walk around this place for three or four years of my life. It's not a bad gig. Not at all. And I mean, they got to play in the Durham Bulls stadium too, which is pretty darn cool. I had the practice field on campus, but that campus is unbelievable. I went out there and visited Griff and then I visited obviously our buddy, Mike Rothenberg uh, after Griff got drafted and, and was uh, gone from Duke. But that's a special place. And I think they have a level of confidence there too, where they where Duke knows oh, if we can get, if we can get them on campus. They won't, they won't want to go anywhere else, but I think you can say something similar to FIU now too. I mean, going to see those facilities and to see the field and, and everything that you guys have going there. I mean, I told a Griff when we were walking out from there last time I was there, I was like, man, you bring a player over here. It's gotta be pretty hard to, to want to go anywhere else. Uh, especially with, what you guys have going on there and having the opportunity to meet, you know, coach Melendez who obviously knows what he's doing there and has a son that had an an incredible year, uh, but also just the way he approaches the game and just listening to him talk to Griff about hitting and and little things that I'm excited to see, you know, where this program's headed. And and it's cool that I get to talk to you every time about it and check in and uh, what were three months out from the first game or was it four months? 18th. It's going to be fun. Yeah, about three months. When are you guys releasing the schedule? I'm trying to I'm trying to see where you guys are playing, 
No, no schedule release yet. I, I could probably get one to you. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I got to make sure I don't slip up and, uh, and say on air, I can't wait for this series here. But yeah. Right. Presumably I'll, you guys, I'll, let you, I'll give you a thumbs up when it's official. <laughs> All right. Well, I know that FIU typically plays Miami and, uh, I grew up a Miami fan, but I'll, I'll be rooting for FIU in that one. Assuming that that happens this year. That's I think we have two mid two midweek games against Miami. Yeah. That's like one of those that you don't even have to tell me that always happens, uh, yep. but it'll be really fun. I'm looking forward to it. Obviously we'll have a uh, talk from the coaching side uh, for the rest of the year. And obviously we will have a lot of talk about these contracts, free agency, and a lot of crazy stuff going on. And then also, I think you teased it well in this episode. I want to spend a lot of time in the next episode talking a little bit about strike again, because we talked about it a few months ago, but we're getting there again, where they say inevitable work stoppage, all of these things. Um, and, and it'll be really helpful to have your, uh, your insight. And as a player who already went through one strike, seeing what the probability might be there again. I, I think ultimately though, money is going to prevail and nobody wants to lose any more of that on either side. And I'm hoping that that's, what's going to inspire a, uh, an agreement uh, from both sides. But last question is, did you have any other, any other exams uh, since the 87? Not yet. Not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. <laughs> All right. Well, that'll do it for today's or this week's episode. And we'll be back next week with some CBA talk a little bit more free agent discussion, and we'll decide what throwback stuff we're going to talk about as well. As always, it is a pleasure. This was Outside the Box with Jeff Conine, and we'll be back next Monday for another episode. Thanks, Aaron. We'll see you then.